is good or bad. Friends, Namaste and welcome to another edition of Gyan Ganga, Words of Wisdom. And on Saturday, we call it uh, Economic Words of Wisdom, Arth Gyan Ganga. So we are there with our ninth episode of our Saturday show with Dr. Subramaniam Swami, along with Arvind Chaturvedi and Ramesh Swami. As you know, we have the Saturday and Sunday programs, Sunday program is at 8 p.m. and Saturday programs. This series we are doing on the economic words of wisdom. And we already had 21 episodes of legal words of wisdom. So we welcome you all viewers across the globe on our four social media channels of Virat Hindustan Sangam. That is Twitter, Periscope, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you are welcome to watch us on any of these four uh, channels. And we are also... Uh, for especially the students and others who are interested in our lectures and past episodes, I have to tell you that we uh, on YouTube and other platforms, most of the past lectures, episodes, which is more than 136 episodes and uh, past eight episodes of uh, words of wisdom on uh, economic words of wisdom and 21 episodes of legal words of wisdom are all available on YouTube please go to Virat Hindustan Sangam channel on YouTube and you will get all the uh, past episodes. This is for the information of our viewers who may have tuned in late or those who have tuned in after last few months because we started this program more than 13 months ago to be precise on 2nd of April 2020 on Ram Naomi Day and we have the 136 episode today putting the Saturday and Sunday shows together. So with this, we start today's program. And the topic is concept of economic growth. And in the next one hour, Dr. Swami, Arvind Chaturvedi, Ramesh Swami and others will be discussing. And Dr. Swami will give you an insight into the concept of economic growth. And I wish to thank our uh, technical team led by Ashish Shetty, Tejas Navalgol, Gadgi Rakesh, Ishwar Ayyar, Swaminathan and Vishal Mehta for their useful inputs to put this uh, informative session together. So with these words, it is over to Dr. Swami for his lecture on today's uh, topic. Over to Dr. Swami on concept of economic growth. Dhanyavad. Thank you. Dr. Swami, you are muted. Ramesh. Okay. How do I unmute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is already now. Unmuted. It's okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jagdish. Uh, I uh, today will uh, deal with uh, essentially uh, the leftover on the input-output analysis, uh, and then uh, crucially, I'll deal mostly with the concept of economic development. And what are the variables we should look at? So tomorrow when I, or day after when I speak about economic development of India or China, uh, well, what is the basis for discussion? I mean, people talk all loosely. Somebody talks about GDP. Somebody talks about investment. Somebody talks about private enterprise, you know. Uh, but 
as a, a person of economics, how should you look at a country's economic growth and development? There is a difference between economic growth and development. And uh, so, the first thing let me say that economic development is an omnibus word for the growth in the economy of all the various uh, important uh, variables, then how it is distributed. And for distribution, of course, uh, we have uh, um, uh, in our syllabus put in a word called Pareto optimality, which I will come to later. It is not a very big thing, it is a small thing. So, uh, that and so uh, the um, uh, um, distribution also includes the distribution of producer production, which is measured by the GDP over agriculture, ma manufacturing and services. These are the three main sectors of the uh, economy and uh, everything else can be fitted into one of these. So, uh, the economy is number one, uh, its growth rate is measured by GDP. And what is GDP? We will get more precise uh, 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 answers uh, today. And then uh, the, uh, the structural aspects as it is called is how much agriculture is making progress, how much is industry making progress, how much is services making progress. They are all, every activity or economy can be classified in within these three. So, that is why we call it a structure. And so, in addition to that, we have the issue of distribution. Is this a fair distribution of income? Uh, so, this is a, a, another aspect which is a, which is where I will bring in Pareto optimality and things like that. Then the question of how efficiently is your resources being used? You can get higher growth rate with the same resources as if you uh, uh, that some countries are getting in low growth rates. India is a classic example that its efficiency in the use of resources is so poor because of corruption, this, that, you know, inefficiency, favoritism and so on. Uh, so, what can be, if the efficiency is good by international standards, then what would be the growth rate as opposed to the growth rate today? So, this kind of uh, comparisons will come in. But the most important thing is all accelerations in growth in the history of economic history. The main, there are two main lessons of economic history. One is that Innovation is key for acceleration growth. If uh, locomotives had not been invented by the British, had uh, Bessemer steel uh, blast furnace for steel had not been into, uh, uh, invented by British scientists, well, industrial revolution in England would never have taken place. Of course, the industrial revolution in France, Germany all came by copying. Then the next revolution was of uh, <coughs> United States when they brought in wireless and telephones and then uh, went on and on uh, ultimately jet engines and finally at the end of this uh, last century uh, to internet which has been a great factor in the efficiency in the use of resources. So, consequently uh, these are some of the things that uh, we uh, need to um, uh, understand. Now, economic growth and development, how is it de 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 decided? I would like uh, Ramesh to upload that article. This is Leontief, we will come to that uh, just after this. Uh, Leontief, uh, uh -huh, this one. I saw it is some ordinary newspaper, Millennium or something, and I saw this article by a writer who is an IS officer. I is given the clearest presentation of input output analysis. And so, in that, uh, you know, how the three sectors, uh, agriculture, industry, how they you know, transform, so on. So, I'd like you in your leisure. I mean, I'm not, I don't think this is for the kind of knowledge I want to impart. It's not very important that you should read this very seriously. When, whenever you get uh, time, please do read it. And he has put it very simply uh, what input output analysis is. Dr. Okay, Dr. let's the link to yes. the article. To, with huh. I have shared the link to the article with all of them. Okay, fine. Okay, yes, you please share the link so that they can download it and read it at uh, leisure. Okay, let us go back. Now, 
uh, why do we use the word macroeconomics? Because microeconomics is a particular transaction between the consumer and is going to the market to buy, uh, or a producer who wants to maximize profit on the availability based on the availability of capital and labor. So the, the that becomes microeconomics. Macroeconomics is the total economy, all interdependent. That is why now let us go to the input output to give you a broad idea of how the uh, thing is done. Now in the next one or the one before whichever. Huh. So we have three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, labor. Uh, I mean uh, we call it services but mostly it is based on uh, labor, you know services, uh, restaurants, this thing, that thing. Where well, capital involvement is very little. So the agriculture uh, produces seeds, so seeds are used as inputs for future agriculture. So therefore, and then the hay and all are used as manure. So therefore, from agriculture, some of it is taken out, which is 25 uh, out of the total output of 250, 25 goes to as inputs to agriculture. 175 goes for manufacturing to produce. A uh, variety of products you see, you want to produce uh, uh, soft drinks, that is a manufacturing uh, industry, but it comes from agricultural products. Same thing with jams and so many other things. So, agriculture uh, of the 250, uh, 175 units go to inputs. And then what is left, uh, it is in the, in the services, you know, hardly any is, uh, is, uh, goes into services because it is all labor services, uh, you know. Um, so, it does not come in. So, final demand is uh, 200 minus 50, two, 250 minus 200, and that is 50, that is available in the market for the consumer. Uh, then, similarly with uh, labor, as, uh, as similarly uh, with labor services, which of course uh, are all used in, uh, in, in inputs, and then in the final product, uh, we uh, we'll see it separately uh, in, as is as a part of uh, another. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, table. Now I put it now mathematically just for convenience. Industry one x one one means first industry input in first industry in its own industry. Second input in second industry, uh, and so on and so forth the nth industry. So, first uh, industrial product, first industry's product of which the portion that goes as input into industry number n is that and if you add them all it becomes all the sales there. Similarly, uh, if you add this way all the purchases made of inputs of uh, industry uh, one is just add this way. This way you add you get the output of the industry. This way you add you get the total purchases or inputs uh, of the industry. So next uh, paragraph, uh, table please. This is not uh, you know I do not want to um, uh, uh, complicate matters. This is the matrix analysis of how to find out what is the amount that is to be used in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in inputs and how it is to be used by outputs and basically what I am trying to say is that we say that x uh, here x1 uh, the amount that is used in say uh, in uh, industry number 1 uh, is a, if uh, a ratio B11 and, uh, add, uh, and if you apply that ratio to x1 you get the inputs. This is the output total output. So, the same way x2 is the total output and there is a uh, b12 uh, how do i get to b11 and b12 or b21 and b22 by econometrics by statistical analysis take all the past records of inputs and outputs and then do a uh, you know an, um, uh, uh, statistical analysis of it you will get it so the uh, econometrics comes into this it's a separate subject and then you can see uh, that these equations are on and maybe later on my 5 and I will come to actually doing at the moment I am saying 
matrix analysis, I mean, as you go deeper, the mathematics becomes more and more complex. So, but I'm showing you that you, if you want to proceed the study of, um, uh, of uh, input output analysis, which is the basis of the national uh, accounting system from which you get the GDP, then you have to know matrix analysis and determinants and you must know the difference uh, and uh, you must know how to uh, calculate the inverse of a matrix. Uh, so like that, uh, the, I'm just giving you this as an example. Next, uh, 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 next uh, slide please. Now these are some numerical numbers and uh, this numerical numbers. Uh, now, yes, yeah, so we'll go next to, now Kuznets was the one who uh, uh, defined modern economic growth which is used widely now because previously there was Adam Smith and there was Ricardo, this man, that man, so many people defined economic growth. But the person who laid down and this is now followed by all economic courses in the, wor in the world uh, at the advanced level is Kuznets definition. What does he say? that you have capital and you have labor. No, no, please don't go. Huh? You have capital and you have labor. They interact with innovation and technology. And that innovation and technology has to have an infrastructure, physical, roads, this thing, you know, markets, so many things, financial, stock market, so on and so forth. Uh, human, that is uh, labor, uh, you know, uh, skilled labor, unskilled labor. Uh, and social means the circumstances in which you hold it, where, where you can carry out the, uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, industrial activity. And social includes uh, pollution and things like that, that you have to, how to avoid and so on. Now, all these things together then give you the following four things. Uh, by the way, physical includes energy, transport, construction, telecom. Financial includes intermediation, you know, uh, buying and selling in the stock market, prudential norms. Human is courts, bureaucracy, laws, governance. And uh, social is health, education, environment, safety nets. Safety nets is sometimes you say you cannot earn less than so much. And or that uh, if you get, uh, if you are in a pay scale below that, then the government will give you free lunch when you go to the factory uh, and to work. So like that it says, so these are the, um, for the four parts of uh, what I would call as infrastructure. We'll go to it, uh, we'll go to the physical one later. No, it's, it's, uh, we're still, uh, uh, I'm finished with it. So these are the four outcomes of economic growth we have to analyze. When we are talking about economic development, uh, we will of course, uh, talk about other things about inequality and this and that, but broadly for economic growth, the growth rate, reduction in poverty, the number of people below the poverty line, structural change, how much agriculture, how much industry, how much services, productivity for every unit of capital or every unit of labor, the output per capital per unit of capital and output per unit of labor. That is the productivity that we are talking about. Okay, next, uh, uh, next slide. Here I am thinking about the infrastructure, electricity, um, non-conventional energy, telecommunication, roads, bridges, uh, in, inland waterways, airports, railways, irrigation, storage, oil and gas pipeline network. These are what they call as infrastructure proper. Uh, we can have educational infrastructure, you can have social infrastructure, all that, but that's loosely using the word infrastructure. But in economics, we use the hard infrastructure concept and that is this. When you say infrastructure, you really mean these. These are the things that we need to focus on. We are doing well in roads and bridges because of Mr. Gadkari. We are doing not so good in airports because of all this attempt at, in my belief, uh, or my belief in, in, you know, privatization and so on. We have made a mess of the whole thing. Railways, by and large, is okay. Uh, irrigation, lot of waste of water takes place. So, these are 
uh, some other things which uh, will uh, which you will have to learn turn by turn. Uh, electricity means generation, so generation level. Transmission, much of the robbery that takes place is in the transmission and the distribution. And then of course local power stations, so where the thing is uh, you know uh, rerouted and so on. So these are some of the things that, that you should know. Next, uh, uh, next one. Uh, Ramesh, yeah. Now I come to Kuznet's formal definition of economic growth. It is a long term rise in capacity of production, of course. How is it measured? By GDP growth rate and is per capita. Per capita means GDP divided by population. India is very high in GDP. It is the third largest in the world, but in per capita, like the Chinese, we are right very far down in the in the. Then we are below all the European countries and Japan and so on. Otherwise, we are ahead of all of them by absolute GDP growth. So one is a long-term rise in capacity. That is economic growth, not short-term rising or going up and down like we have been doing. Then to supply increasingly diverse goods to its population, that is called structural change. Means agriculture, well, you know, what new diverse goods you can have in agriculture? It's more or less fixed. But manufacturing will get locked. Different kinds of servicing. Sometimes you know, servicing also includes uh, uh, tourism, hotels, and so on. Now, just a little down, please. Just a little down, little down, little down, little down. In India, 2004, the percentage share of employment by sectors for agriculture, which I put agriculture, in 2004 was as high as almost 70 percent and has been steadily coming down till 2010 and after that is flattened out. Why it is flattened out? Good question. Of course, agriculture has grown faster after 2010, so that may be one factor, but maybe later on, if I get a chance, we will have a breakdown. Industry rose, and this is the most disturbing part, after that a slight decline. Industry should be rising all the time, now overtake agriculture. But our economic growth has not been like that. And industry, in fact, is, I uh, will show you in the next uh, thing, but uh, service rose and then it flattened out. Service was rising very fast. So let us go to the next uh, next table. Ramesh, next table. Yes. In 1950, services was only 30 percent of GDP. Today it is 60 percent, uh, so 55 percent thereabouts. Industry was only 15 percent in 1950. Today it is running not very much higher, almost a flat between 2011 and 2019, which is very disturbing, uh, at about say 20, 22 percent. Uh, and services, of course, is, is, this is a very unusual thing in any country. Most countries after development, industry overtakes in share of GDP takes over uh, of, of the other two sectors. And after that comes in, uh, in services, after that comes agriculture. But in India, agriculture is certainly declined. Uh, it was very high in, when we got in independence, it was 70 percent. Then over the years it's been coming down. Now it's somewhere around 16 percent. That is GDP, production. Even today, labor, as I showed you earlier, was running at almost 60, 60, 65 percent. So too much labor is there in uh, agriculture and it has to be brought out by making them uh, into semi-skilled people and then putting them in places in industry. Uh, industry is too low and uh, therefore uh, we need now to uh, seriously discuss how to industrialize much faster. Next, uh, do you have another uh, graph for this? Uh, Ramesh? Okay. Now I come to growth rates. 
I am going to compare it with China later, but just now, under Narendra Modi, I don't want to go too far into 2014-15, but 2016, no, 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 please, no, 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 2017, the which uh, it is uh, which quarter fourth quarter that is 2017 18th fourth quarter means january 1 2018 to march 31st 2018 that time we had uh, we reached uh, a, a, a growth rate according to all the fiddling they have done with the index numbers and all i'll come to that a little later because that's my favorite subject in which i wrote a joint paper with paul samuelson but uh, you know i don't want to impose my research on you. I want you to learn something in a broad term. So 2018-17-18 financial year, which starts from 1st April, goes to 31st March of the next year. I don't know why we have this cockeyed system. The British gave it to us and we are continuing it. All other countries have January 1 to December 31st. But, uh, you know, uh, we are still sticking with this. So that quarter 4 is January 1. Uh, to March 31st of 2018 and uh, it starts with April, May, June. So first quarter, April, May, June, like first quarter here, it's April, May, June. Then uh, 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 quarter 2 is July 1, August, end of September. Then, uh, uh, then uh, first October, November, end of December, then January 1, um, um, February, March. So that is the, so in this, when you say 2019-20 quarter 1, the quarter 1 means January 1, 2020 uh, to 31st March 2020. So that is when, uh, you know, just about the time we put a lockdown. So now you see these curves, I mean, how can you say that we were performing well? Incidentally, uh, even these curves, if I use my index number knowledge, then this will not be 8.1%, but 6.1%. But you know, why should I quarrel about this? I say, okay, other, other um, uh, previous uh, uh, um, administration of, uh, of uh, UPA can also now use our new index number and get a higher figure, but it doesn't matter. The trend is what is important. The trend is continuously down. And in quarter 4, what is quarter 4? Uh, quarter 4 is um, uh, 20, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2021, January, uh, 2020, uh, January uh, 1st to March 31st. You had already had this big uh, drop. And again a drop. And we were coming up and now boom, again we have gone down. So, we are nowhere near uh, all the, the talk of high growth rates or doubling of, uh, of our GDP and so on. So this is the Indian situation. We will have a further discussion later on. But GDP, question is how is it uh, calculated? We will come to it in a minute. What is the next graph? Let's, let me have a look. Yeah, this will uh, later on. We have not gone to globalization. That is next lecture. So okay, now I am through with my graphs. Later on, I think in another uh, 10 minutes, I will have uh, Arvind explain some of the graphs he has, uh, uh, he has drawn up for you to explain to, explain to you. Now, uh, what is GDP? GDP is, if I put it in input-output terms, subtracting all the uh, x11, x12, x13, then x21, x21, you know, all that subtracting from the final production. This final production is net of the inputs because I do not want to count my performance in the economy by double counting. So if I am producing, looking for how much steel we have produced in the country for final use, it is used intermediate in the intermediate uh, way, for example, to produce a cycle, motor car, build houses, all these require steel. So all the steel you produce is already gone there. So we, are, we cannot include it because later on I have to include the 
um, uh, the uh, output of motor cars, I have to input the motor car of cycles, I have to include the uh, production of houses, there I will be again counting steel. So that would be double counting and therefore out. So only if you have the input output table, you won't have to do any fresh calculations. You can just look at a column, final, uh, final output or final demand. So that the column will give you uh, and then you multiply each by price because there one will be in, uh, in kilograms, one will be in uh, tons and another will be in liters and all that. So you use the prices and which prices I will come to when I do index numbers. There is a lot of tricks Tricks you can play there. You can make a sinking government look a <laughs> rising government. Uh, thank God uh, Majetli and Nirmala does not know all of it. So <laughs> they have not been able to put too much spin in what they have been putting out. So uh, they have to rely on economists and those economists uh, will not have the nerve to fudge like that. So uh, now, uh, so this net output is uh, um, uh, the total net output in the country plus services. So restaurant, restaurant is a service. So that service has to be evaluated. Uh, if somebody is cooking in a, in a, in a, in a ca cafeteria, that wages of that person has to be taken as a product, as a measure of product. Of course, some things you can't do. For instance, if I have uh, my wife works in my, the kitchen and uh, she provides a service, should I include her uh, in the national income? Answer is by convention, there is no argument. By convention, you cannot. But if my wife works in the neighbor's kitchen and produces food for the neighbor and neighbor's wife comes to my house and uh, produces the uh, uh, lunch, dinner, breakfast uh, in my house, then her activity will have to be evaluated in the uh, national income. It looks ridiculous, but it was also ridiculous that you will expect my wife to go and work and uh, cook food in my neighbor's house or <laughs> my neighbor's wife will come to my house and uh, cook food. Uh, so therefore, there are many conventions. And you have to be very careful. I had when, when I first was entered into a picture of uh, studying India and China at Harvard, the general opinion is China is going much faster than India. I am talking of the period 1950 to 1980. Everybody's view was that. All American scholars and so on, India nowhere, all Indian leftists like Mamatya Sen on India nowhere, China far ahead. So Simon Kuznets told me, somehow I do not find this uh, believable. So will you have a close look? And he had taught me national income and I had become a ma maestro at that time. I was, uh, I was uh, one of the uh, experts of uh, economics in uh, index numbers and national income and so on. So I sat down and I said, what is it that the Chinese do? That is not according to the standards laid down by the United Nations on the system of national accounts for purposes of estimating national income or GDP. Gross, gross national income means you without removing the depreciation because all the machinery is used in one year, it depreciates. So you should really for value purposes remove the depreciation estimate. But if you do not, it is called gross. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, if you say constant prices, it means you fix one price, 2014, and everything else will be evaluated in 2014 prices, not in 2015 prices, 2016 prices. So that's current price. So you got to be careful because if there's inflation, your GDP will look huge compared to what really it is. So therefore, uh, those are adjustments. But I found in the case of China that they were doing all kinds of things which is not done under the United Nations uh, system of counts, which is uh, what everybody has to follow. And China joined in 1980 only and so after that they began improving their thing. So one of the things they did was that in our country we wave uh, rice after the husk is taken out. But China they, Weigh the rice with the husk on. 
Now that means another 15 percent increase in production in the weight of, of rice production. Now if you compare India and China that is not fair. They are uh, including husk uh, and uh, we are not using husks, uh, husk because the United Nations says you can't. So therefore uh, the GDP uh, has to be corrected for that. Another thing I noticed to my surprise is that in our GDP calculation we do not include uh, certain vegetables like uh, potato. Uh, potato is not included in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the calculation of agricultural products. Why and all that's another matter. But China included them. China included uh, you know, all kind all kinds of things which fatten the estimates. So I wrote a book which was published by the University of Chicago Press on the uh, economic growth of India and China. I came to the conclusion that between the period 1950 and 1980, the growth rate of China and India was the same. Oh, everybody was so angry. Like nowadays there are people are angry when I tweet something. The same way everyone pounded on me. I am an anti-Indian nationalist. I am, uh, you know, uh, fudged my figures, this thing. But nobody could prove I was wrong and I had the backing of, uh, you know, uh, uh, not only Simon Kuznets and Paul Samuelson, but uh, Leon Tef, so many. Leon Tef was also my teacher and my third thesis advisor. And so uh, I withstood it. But in India, I, I couldn't withstood it because Mrs. Gandhi was against me because I was saying socialism does not work. It did not work in China. It was, does not work in India. So I am saying to you, all these numbers are sacred numbers. So you must know its correct definition. And that correct definition will give you the GDP. Then Pricing, supposing I value prices in the latest year, say 2021, uh, 2021 prices and then evaluate all my previous GDPs uh, in the 2021 price, I'll get a much higher figure for GDP. And so I found that uh, this is what Jetley did, must have been told by Chidambaram because they are both of the same mental makeup. So therefore, uh, suddenly he was showing 8 percent, 9 percent and all that. But when you use a consistent base period, then in the comparison you will find that we never exceeded 7 percent the first two years. And then we are down to 3 percent in the last quarter before the corona virus pandemic. That is the fourth quarter uh, which is January 1 to March 31st, 2020, our growth rate was just 3%, 3.1%, which is lower than Jawaharlal Nehru's period, which uh, leftists at that time instead of saying is the Soviet model which is not working, uh, it was 3.4%, 3.5% per year, it was higher than this. Narsimha Rao produced in the last two years over 8% growth rate. So therefore, in, at that time, nobody could believe that we can grow at 8 percent. There was, a, in fact, Amartya Sen and all these economists used to say 3.5 percent per year is the Hindu rate of growth. We can't grow faster than that as long as we are Hindus. Well, now, he, of course, he is, he is no more in the country, so we don't have to worry too much about what he says. But the fact is that all these can be manipulated. And uh, therefore, keep that in mind. Then when somebody tells you I can get $5 trillion by doubling GDP in 5 years and I will do it, then I told you calculation show you will have a growth rate of 14.4 percent, uh, which is impossible because we are growing only at 3 percent at that rate at that time. Not that we can't grow at 14 percent, of course we can. You tell me uh, what way I can tell you, it will be a big lecture, but uh, I can tell you. Tomorrow if I am given the, uh, the responsibility for the finance ministry, I can tell you it will take me just two years to get us back on a 10 percent growth rate, not back for the first time um, exceeding 8 percent to 10 percent. Keep that for 10 years, you will overtake China and you will be competitive with America. Why can't it be done? Uh, that is part of my lecture. I am going to lecture on that. But today I will conclude by saying that economic development is more than economic growth. Economic growth is only the growth of 
uh, of GDP and uh, its, uh, its structure which is agriculture, um, uh, manufacturing and uh, services. And these three uh, were, you know, they are, they form the uh, structural part of, uh, of GDP and how they move is a matter for study. Then when you come to development, you have to see, are you using new, new innovations? Are you using bullock carts or using locomotives? Or are you using locomotives or using aeroplanes? Or are you using uh, internet or you are using post office? So these are things which go into the component and they together you have to look at. And then I will bring in the question of demand and supply and therefore finance. And this is a, this macroeconomics, you know, it's a mind boggling thing. And you must have a mind which concentrates on it and you have to learn it step by step. Nobody can learn it in one, one class, nobody can learn it. But I'm trying to make you sort of uh, economic savvy so that tomorrow if you are take a formal course, you will not be a stranger uh, to these concepts. So for today, I am concluding on the fact that I have covered uh, what in, in input output analysis is, I have covered what is, uh, what is the concept of macroeconomics, I have covered uh, what, uh, uh, what economic growth is and what, uh, you know, I have not yet shown you mathematically how innovation affects economic growth. I will in the next lecture, but today I think I'll stop at this and hand it over to Mr. Chaturvedi to speak about his uh, graphs and what it means. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swami. Uh, before I display the graph, I have something uh, uh, similar uh, to share the growth of the economy that you had shown. I have a different graph to show. Uh, this is what I want to show. In fact, you have shown this even beyond uh, the 1920, but this slightly is slightly better graph in terms of, so it shows a very clear declining trend, very clear declining trend. And the declining trend is even sharper uh, from uh, quarter one of 1819. As you can see, 8.7.04, 6.6, 5.8, 5, 4, 3, and then goes uh, the the, uh, the corona thing, and now it is minus uh, 23% of what Yeah, corona you have not included. You have only used the last quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, before the corona. That right, right, right. And uh, then uh, uh, I had prepared some graphs showing the economic growth. Economic growth, economic growth of China and in India both, and then some factors of economic growth. Uh, so, uh, uh, one more thing I wanted to add, you had mentioned the uh, input-output analysis, the uh, reverse ma matrix. I had actually worked out a complete example of two okay. sectors example, a two sector okay. example. And this two sector example, we can actually by reversing the matrix that I minus M uh, inverse, uh, we can even find out how much output do we need in an industry for a particular uh, percentage of growth. So uh, that is what uh, the viewers should also know in order to just, you have mentioned that it's a complicated mathematics, though it is complicated mathematics, uh, inverse of a matrix and all that. But this was just an example, uh, that example I just like to share. And this example is this two sector, uh, two sector example. And these two sectors are oil and transportation oil and transportation, uh, uh, the transportation requires oil and the oil sector also needs transportation. So it is basically two, two by two uh, sector analysis. And we are saying, suppose the cost of production of $1 worth of oil is 0.32 in oil cost that is the B1 and 0.12 in transportation cost that is B2. So you can have this, uh, the matrix B1, B2, uh, B2. B11, B12, B21, B24. And then you can work out using this example that how much oil is going into the oil industry and how much oil is going to transportation industry by using the reverse. Uh, this is the mat matrix I have prepared based on this data. And D1, D2 is basically the objective of the industry. Uh, you said from econometrics equation we can get. 
So D1, D2 yeah. is there. Once the D1, D2 is identified, we can uh, inverse this matrix uh, uh, and then find out how much production do we need. And uh, this inversion of matrix, there are some calculation correction that I have done here. So the output required is 26.03. And where is the, uh, the initial, it was only 12. So we can use this for a much larger uh, input output in the, uh, matrix. This is just example for two by two, but we can have much larger. And then we can find out how much uh, output do we actually need because some of this output 26.3 billion dollar will go into the transportation and remaining will be used for oil. So this is just one example that I had worked out. Then uh, uh, the other graph that I had Ramesh will share. Yeah, one minute. Ramesh? One minute, yeah, one minute. Yeah, you have, is this okay? You want me to move down? No, this is the introduction of what Dr. Swami has already said. That these things are very basic things. Uh, this was actually the comparison of economic growth in uh, from 1990 to 2006 for different countries. And as you can see, I mean, uh, some countries will have much higher products uh, 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 progress. Other countries will have much lower product. We, we call them poor or rich country based on the economic growth. Dr. Swami will deal with this subject later on that what is the relationship between economic growth and development. So basically this relates to that. Next. This is the one which uh, uh, need to, to be understood by people that when we, in fact, Dr. Swami had explained using the Kuznets theory. And uh, this is uh, increase in employment is one objective of economic growth. And if there is a fall in unemployment, that means people are earning. And when people are earning, they have money in their hand. When people have money in their hand, that means the demand is going up. When the demand is going up, the industry is, uh, uh, output is going up. And then again, in turn, the employment is going up. So this is a cycle that we are talking about. And uh, uh, when the employment, unemployment falls and employment grows, the money is in the hands of people, which leads to increased consumption. And increased consumption would mean in increased investment. So this is the complete cycle that we are talking about. How much in which sector uh, that is basically done using the input output analysis. And this is the, uh, the growth change year over year. This is not a uh, annual growth, but this is year over year. As you can see, in some of the years, the economy has grown in terms of GDP, the growth has taken place. But overall, when you look at this from 2013 to 2015, it went up. 2016 was the peak, as Dr. Swami has already mentioned, uh, about 8%. And after that, as you can see, there is a continuous declining decline barring one period in 2018. Uh, this is the year on year, as I said. So this is not annual growth rate. This is not annual growth rate. This is changes year on year. And this is what the real picture is. India's GDP 2020. Dr. Swami has also given the figures. This shows a, a bar chart of different years. And last uh, few quarters, 2020 onwards, as you can see, it is declining. Now we say we are in the phase of recovery. I'm sure the second wave of Corona will actually damage it further. So if we had uh, uh, expecting some from minus 23% growth, I think it may go to minus 26%, 27%. It is yet to be assessed, but this is going to have a major dent on uh, Indian economy. And uh, compared to Indian economy, uh, I mean, we can say from 2008 onwards, a global recession, all countries were affected. China was not so much affected, except that China's exports were affected uh, in US and other countries. India was not so much dependent on exports, so India was saved. India somehow could absorb the shocks because India's consumption and China's consumption are different. India has much higher uh, domestic consumption as compared to China. China had much higher uh, export. So uh, this is the uh, scenario of China uh, in last few years. The Chinese economy is also the GDP growth is going down. Dr. Swami's several books have shown that China was much ahead of India. And Dr. Swami actually had predicted 
that if India continues on the paths that he has suggested by 2030, we can actually uh, overtake uh, China because China is going down. And it, but unfortunately, in last three and a half years or or rather four years, India has reversed the path of growth which Dr. Swami had suggested, and he had just ten minutes back said that if uh, he has his policies implemented, <laughs> then within two years, that within that's two seriously. years, he can go back <laughs> from the bottom pit to 10%. And in fact, I was reading an article today by the Niti Aayog, uh, by Rajiv Kumar. He also says the same thing, what you had said, actually. He says that we need more than 10% growth for at least 10 years. Uh, and naturally, uh, this 10% growth will not come easily. And uh, for that, these uh, uh, the correct policies have to be implemented. Dr. Swami, there was a, a question from the viewer about the urban in unemployment. So can you say something about the uh, labor intensive uh, technology that we use, labor intensive uh, industry that we have? Uh, how can we uh, uh, overcome this urban unemployment? Urban unemployment uh, was a, became a problem for two reasons. One, we adopted in the beginning the Soviet model, which means heavy industrial investment. And labor was not a, uh, you know, a big component of that. So all the money was going for that. Second was that uh, the uh, uh, labor unions discouraged uh, industries from having a large labor uh, you know, presence in their in their factories. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a uh, MP elected from Bombay uh, twice. Uh, I think uh, 1977 to 1985. Uh, that period, the Bombay trade unionism was at the highest. Of course, I defeated uh, in that both that times. That the, the, not, not only that, first I defeated the, uh, Kulkarni, who was the Raja Kulkarni. chairman. Raja, ah. Kulkarni. Raja Kulkarni was the Intak chairman. I defeated him uh, in a 100% pro uh, I mean, uh, 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 labor uh, constituency. All living in Jhobarpattis mostly. Jagdish knows that very well because he lives in that constituency in the uh, uh, most civilized, <laughs> I mean, more developed part. I mean, relatively more developed part in Ghatkopar. But uh, 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 having defeated that, it was, uh, you know, people were being killed and so on in the labor union. And Dhatta Saman meant only killing people. Mm -hmm. And uh, once he threatened me, so I went and into his, into his adda and said, here I am, try and kill me and see. And he did not. And that made him lose the election also. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, these people are all cowards. They just only threaten and they, they scare people. So now, uh, um, uh, after that, all the industries started going for capital intensive technology so that you don't use much labor. We have to now change it, not overnight. First, you develop MSMEs, the small and medium industries, they can become suppliers to the large industries and they will produce it cheaper. So give them uh, at low interest rate, you give them uh, uh, loans and then that with that loans, they will give the employment to the semi-skilled and they will produce a good part, you see, of, uh, of the factory uh, output and that's the way to generate employment in urban areas. You make it worthwhile for labor. And that will improve the economy because if the labor gets money in their hand, that means demand. And that means right. for, you know, the, the uh, supply will be, you know, all sold out. Right. So these are all interconnected. It's, a, it's a interconnected. Everything is interconnected. Yeah, but yeah. my opinion is that Indian economy is potentially in a position to grow at not less than 10%. It could go as much as 14%. Provided you had the right policies and not the suffocating policies we have continued. Everything is in you know, I put a little tax here. You read the budget documents. I, you know, I, I hate to uh, attend the budget session of parliament because all is a, a, you know, like a babu, you know, uh, uh, these um, uh, gumastas, you know, 
5% uh, we have increased on this, 5 and a half on this, exemption for this. This is all they are reading. Right. What is the objective? What is your priority? What is your strategy? What is where your resource mobilization is going to come from? All these should be put in this structure, uh, this scientific way, but they do not know any economics. So they say all kinds of bakwas. Even the Prime Minister was misled to say that he will double uh, our uh, GDP in 5 years to, to 5 trillion and not realizing it will require 14 percent growth rate. He also said that he will double our agricultural output. I do not know whether you remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah 2018. Farmers, farmers income will also be doubled. Uh, double, but that means in 4 years if you double it, it means 18.6 percent. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the, this is the kind of illiteracy in our system and it has been throughout. Chidambara yeah. was one of the biggest illiterates I came across. Manmohan Singh, you see, he did not have the nerve. In the Nasima Rao's time, he used to ask me what should be done and then he used to go and tell uh, Manmohan Singh, you do this and Manmohan Singh did it efficiently. Montek Singh was finance secretary, he was my commerce secretary also, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he, he did an efficient job. But Somebody has to say this is the risk you have to take. But all this pit, pit, pit is you say what a waste of opportunities for us. And I still say today, if you have a proper economic, uh, I mean, a, a, a proper approach to uh, the finance, uh, the finance ministry, you will definitely be able to grow at 10 percent per year for at least 10 years. In sometimes in the middle, you can even grow at 13, 14 percent per year. Dr. Swami, another question which one viewer had asked, I think it is important and therefore I am requesting you to answer. The question is, they say the economic reforms benefits have been cornered by 10 percent top <laughs> people. I mean, what is your take on this? You are bad with economic reforms. It's not, it's not against economic reforms. What kind of economic reforms? I told Narsim Rao, for example, and I am telling today also if Mr. Modi is willing to listen. I have written to him. Huh? I have written every step that should be taken. Yeah, nothing, only acknowledgement. Thank you very much for your letter. Uh, so, what I am saying is, I, even Narsimha Rao, I told him, you have uh, removed all capital controls. Very good. Uh, you have said all quotas are over. Very good. But nothing else you have said. What will be the propaganda against you? Those who lose their uh, black money from uh, license selling, they are going to turn against you. Those who lose uh, money because there is no more quotas, that is, uh, uh, they will turn against you. So you have to give something to the public because the public will be convinced that you are for capitalists. You have removed this from there for the capitalists, you have removed, and that will hurt you. He didn't listen, but I would have liked him to do is first get the middle class on your side by abolishing income tax and second you uh, lower the interest rates from, uh, for, for loans which means the MSME people will be thrilled no more it will be a uh, uh, people will think that you are doing it only for rich uh, for big business and third so third raise the interest rates on fixed deposits uh, to 9% People will go rushing to save money. Indians are great savers, but they are being made miserable today because of the low interest rates. Even the in the provident fund, they used to give yeah. higher interest rate, which is being brought yeah. down now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they, this is a, so there are so many ways to do it, and uh, just by uh, economic reforms, you can't blame because you are use wrong economic reforms. Hmm. Therefore, uh, the uh, top 20 percent, which is smart, which knows the inside story, done it. Now, uh, Narsim Rao was too nervous to do what I told him to do because the Congress party was already saying that this man has betrayed socialism. He is uh, against Congress. Then, then my, this uh, Sonia Gandhi was doing this propaganda, and people like Mani Shankar yes, were going buck, buck, buck. So, all this uh, I think is, is, has to be seen in broad perspective. That is why economics requires multidimensional thinking. And this is how slowly I have introduced it. First, starting with one person, one firm, and then slowly telling you what are the other variables. And in uh, future lectures, I will deal with more complexity 
of economic planning, how today India wants to come out, what it can do, in what way we are superior to China potentially. I will bring that also out in my thing and this is the way to go forward. Just uh, last question, Dr. Swami, very briefly you can answer this. Uh, you, yeah. We have been talking about economic growth and some people have been asking about disparity. Do you think disparity and economic growth go together? There has to be disparity increase if the growth has to take place. Some people argue yes. <laughs> These are all, you know, the leftist brainwashing that has gone on for the last 60, 70 years. Yes, if you look at countries, uh, the inequality in America is even today much less than India, the most capitalist country. So what happens is that uh, Kuznets had drawn a curve that when economic growth starts, the people who, are, who have got the money, the, uh, the innovation, the investment, they gain. So the inequality increases. And then it reaches a peak by which time the labor has to be, because once the labor gets employed, then there's a labor shortage developing, which means the wages will start going up. So then the thing catches up. So if you look at every country, he says an inverted is in fact, Kuznets is a famous inverted U curve. Yeah. You go up and then after a stage, it starts coming down, which is what happened in the United States. There is no way in our country, a country like ours, to reduce inequality by snatching money from anybody. Because all that person uh, who is a rich man, whom, from whom you are trying to snatch, will bribe the income tax officer, which is what is happening, and not pay. Then they have got all kinds of exemptions built into it. So politicians also want to make them happy, so they put in all these exemptions. So uh, the chartered accountant will do the rest. Uh, rest. So consequently, inequality is can be reduced if you, for example, have a major agricultural development, which can be done because in India it is such fertile land, but we only grow, we, we can grow, do agriculture three times, uh, three seasons in India, in the world, in the, in the country. In other countries you can't do because of the fact that uh, there's snowfall. So five months of the year you can't do in, in America and Europe. But in India, you can do 12 months. So three crops means tripling. Yes. Nothing has been applied here. Yes, yeah, talk, 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 talk. And uh, spin, spin, spin. That's been going on. And uh, we have proved in Nasima Rao's period that you can grow very fast. From 3.5%, you went up to 8% in five years. And it can be done again. Uh, so uh, I think people must know that these are play tools for you economics. There is no such thing as some <coughs> fixed formula. You yeah, have well, been reformed, so therefore there must be, uh, poor people must be discriminated. And the rich people will get uh, all the benefits. No, that's true. The best way to help the poor people is give them employment. And then if when the economy becomes a little stronger, it gave them social security. If you lose your job, you will have a check coming to your house for at least three years. It's called social security in America. Yes. So then the man doesn't feel he has got three years to find another job. So, you know, they, there are ways and ways in which you can reduce in inequality. China has a much higher inequality than India. Why? Yes. Because yes. their urban areas, which are all the industrialized, China's agricultural progress is very limited. But it's industrial production, thanks to the foreigners coming and building uh, companies, has gone booming. So the wages of, of people working in the urban areas has gone up. As a consequence, when you compare rural and, uh, and uh, urban, the inequality has uh, increased. increased. So China's uh, Gini coefficient, which is the measure we use for inequality, is much higher than India's. So I, 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 but that doesn't mean that uh, we are better off. It means that within uh, agriculture, all the everybody is almost almost equal. Within industry, almost everyone is equal. But the average wage of uh, in uh, urban 
is more than the average wage in uh, in uh, rural. Yes. Uh, if Ramesh and uh, yeah. have any questions, yeah, one thing that I mean, you've already answered this. They just said, um, uh, what can the villages contribute to GDP other than the uh, agriculture part of it? Is there anything else that the villages can help in the GDP in the current situation? In the current situation, all small industries can be moved to rural areas. Hmm. Hmm. Every highway, you can help the villagers to set up uh, restaurants, uh, petrol pumps, all that. There are ways to do it. Okay. You get to the village and two, third, tell all villagers, the farmers, you know, there's one category called farmers. They are not able to get a proper price. Look at all this agitation going on. The, if our farmers are able to export, they will get four times what they're getting within India. Why we don't export? Because we don't have a packaging industry. Well, the farmer doesn't know. And those who are, uh, you know, people in the know, they mislead the farmer so that the farmer doesn't think of going to another place. There should be small airports in every every uh, every um, uh, small town, which can uh, fly to a, a big town and then uh, you know, or go to Bombay and uh, offload for the ship. Yeah, it's uh, then cold storage. No cold storages. So the farmer comes to the market. He has to sell, otherwise it'll all rot, and he'll have nothing. So whatever the intermediary tells them, they, they do it. So these are the ways to, uh, and if the farmer pays well, then you can put a minimum wage for workers, like that, you see. Okay. So okay. then you want, you want uh, the uh, uh, solar, uh, solar energy, farmers can get uh, warm uh, hot water in their, uh, for their bathing in winter by solar energy. What about uh, linking all the rivers, they, they, you see this Godavari, um, Krishna, all these rivers are flowing into the ocean, not fully, but 80%, 90%. Whereas Kaveri, there is no water. Vaigai, there is no <laughs> what the name, if you have been to Madhuva, you know. Link all the rivers, the, the, uh, the uh, surplus rivers with the deficit rivers. And you ca make canals. I don't want you to cross the Deccan. Take from the Deccan itself and go south. Rayalaseema has never seen rainfall. If you put a canal from, say, Godavari down to uh, Kaveri, Rayalaseema will become the richest part of India because the soil is so good, but there is no water. These are the things that need to be done to improve the villages. I just want to share one thing, Dr. Tony. Yes. Uh, the first quarter 2021. So China, this yeah. is nonsense because they're covering it with their bottom. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Ask them to cover it with two years ago. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, no, China is great ones in producing statistics. <laughs> I will do a one one lecture. I will do comparing China and Indian economic growth, and where they've made a fool of you. All this IMF and World Bank, they're all bunch of rascals. You see, they don't do any work. They don't, they don't dare, they are too afraid of China to dare to modify their, uh, their uh, statistics or tell China, no, no, you can't do this. There's a United Nations uh, manual for uh, ND, uh, GDP. You have to follow that. They, they, have, none, they have no nerves. See? So there, therefore, uh, anything you hear about China in the general press, don't believe it till you have cross-checked with me. Okay, how will you come close? Do you have any uh, question? I, no, I, I think it's too late. Uh, I only want to add to what Dr. Swami has been campaigning that for coastal areas, besides solar energy and linking of rivers, Dr. Swami has been campaigning for desalination of seawater. Ah, and right, that right. Concern, which coastal areas and India has such a vast coastline that can become uh, very, very useful. 
so i only had that comment to make i think arvind you yeah. need to i i i i lied to that by saying we have already experimented that in the kalpakam uh, uh, reactor in tamil nadu where the municipality said we can't give you water and they desalinated today the only place you get 24 hours a day pure filtered water is in the kalpakam residential colony the nuclear reactor call same thing with jamnagar this ambani's uh, mukesh ambani he 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 was told that by the uh, municipality of of jamnagar we can't give you water for this uh, uh, refinery that you are setting up so they built a fantastic i mean i've visited it i mean they may be you may criticize them for other things i i i i don't want to get into that but i will say that i saw the desalination plant in jamnagar and i was so impressed all entire workers get 24 hours uh, tap water which is pure mm. here if you mm. drink tap water bus you will have to go to anna to the hospital right away <laughs> our municipalities are all polluters okay thank you thank you and dr sami uh, this subject is so fascinating economic growth and since uh, once we link it with the economic development uh, whether we are talking about society at a micro level or we are talking about national level these issues and today you address these issues including you also talked about how to increase the people's income um, how to improve the economy by uh, uh, enriching the msmes especially investing in the small skill sector and the urban employment question also you address thank you very much we will be talking about policy issues in the coming uh, weeks you will be also talking about glo glo globalization and then you will be talking about comparison of india and china as you just now said thank you very much uh, for uh, bringing these issues for our viewers uh, thanks uh, ramesh swami uh, for uh, preparing the the uh, material background material and also jagdish shetty uh, our technical team led by ashish shetty ishwar ayer gadgi rakesh tejas swaminathan and vishal mehta tomorrow sunday at 8 pm we will be meeting in words of wisdom gyan ganga and we will be discussing the recent uh, output uh, outcome of the elections and uh, 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 all the five states the results will be out by tomorrow so tomorrow sunday at 8 pm indian standard time will be meeting with dr swami and some guests thank you very much till then namaskar jain